couldn't quite recognize myself, so. Um, and thank you, Maureen, um, the talk selection panel and the Academy of Medical Sciences, and Naomi Clark, who worked with me for the press release. Um, it's a great honor and privilege to be here today. Um, I'm supposed to be giving you um, a short talk about the research that I've been involved with recently, and I thought I'd focus it on my studies on decoding the developing human immune system. And this is part of the work um, within the Human Cell Atlas um, Initiative. Um, and you can see here the ambitious mission of this initiative, which is to map the 37 trillion cells in our body. Um, and the first question that we want to ask, perhaps, is why do we need an atlas? And for me, there are two reasons. One is actually the ability to look at um, the human organism, or, or any organ for that matter, in a system context. So if you were to look at immunology, for a very long time, we have actually looked at the components of the immune system. One is either a T cell immunologist, a B cell biologist, uh, but we never look at it as one system. And also this system exists in organs where it's actually interacting with the immune environment. So the ability to actually understand the cells within their context and how they interact with one another is a great, powerful um, source of information and atlasing can allow that. The second, with regards to emergent properties, and these are patterns or properties that you will not see if you were to study components in isolation and is only evident when the entire system is assembled together. And the analogy, um, as Sarah says, in this context is the migratory bird pattern that you only see when flocks of bird are together, birds are together. So I'm going to focus on the work that I've been leading um, in, in the UK on the Development Cell Atlas, um, and that's funded by Wellcome. And a little bit of background to understanding how the immune system develops uh, in utero. We have several um, anatomical sites where blood and immune cells are made. It starts off in the yolk sac very early on, and then you have the definitive hematopoietic stem cells made in the aortogonado mesonephros, and subsequently the liver becomes a dominant source of um, making blood and immune cells, and then only later on does bone marrow become um, an important uh, location. And that's really in the second trimester, uh, well after 20 post-conception weeks. We also know that the thymus and the spleen are important sites where T cells and B cells undergo their subsequent um, differentiation and maturation, respectively. And we have the non-lymphoid tissues, such as the skin and kidney, where all of these immune cells that are made um, colonize and actually reside there, um, interacting intimately with their environment and shaping um, the homeostasis um, and function of that organ. So we set out on a very ambitious program, which was essentially to look at how the immune system develops, taking all of these organs, all of the cells within the organ, so that we had the complete systems picture. Um, and in humans, you can only do that by studying snapshots during development. So we had many different stages, and we took as many of the organs from the same embryo or fetal sample. And this really has allowed us to stitch together how the immune system develops in time and space. It was a daunting task, um, and, uh, but you know, of immense opportunity. Just imagine what we could find out and where we could go. And there was also two other things that I want to talk about, the different approach in science within the human cell atlas. One is the reliance or use, exploitation of cutting edge technologies, which are generating big data sets but ultimately, this is not generating data for the sake of generating data, but really to understand biology. And this is where I think revolution in medicine really needs external expertise outside of medical sciences, uh, as well as in, from inside of, of medical sciences. So we need to kind of work together with people who are chemists, physicists, uh, you know, computational experts and mathematics, etc. The second is with regards to the research culture. And here, there is no one person who would have a laboratory that can actually undertake this kind of work, the scale of the um, approach um, and what is um, the ambitious um, aims. 
So we really do need team science, where people with disparate skill sets have to come together and work openly, not just amongst themselves, but with the broader community, because there are other, many other experts outside of the kind of human cell atlas community necessarily, who have the uh, necessary skills and expertise that will make the kind of understanding the biology far more impactful. So revolution in medicine needs collaboration. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of um, examples of how we've achieved this. So in our studies of the human kidney, you know, we worked openly in team science fashion with Sam Bajati, who was leading the work on looking at uh, uh, Wilms tumor. So we were able to use the development atlas to basically pinpoint that Wilms tumor was essentially arborine nephron development. And in the manuscript, we basically show where all the cell types that could be the origin of these cells. And what it means is that there's a new way of thinking about treatment in that we could actually uh, induce nephron uh, differentiation rather than necessarily cytoreductive chemotherapy, or, uh, which, which has these um, adverse effects. We also use the kidney development data to try and understand how the immune zonation in kidney, which you see in the adult kidney, uh, is established to protect us from urinary tract infections. Um, and this is, I've just put in here some of the kind of Twitter feed where there's focus and, and, and actually a lot of recognition of the superlative collaborative work and how this data is also made uh, public um, and in this context using the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative cell by gene software so that other people can benefit from these data sets uh, for the research questions that they are exploring. So in understanding uh, fetal development, it was also important to understand how this is supported. So the maternal fetal interface that is supporting um, pregnancy. And again, it's only through the contributions of outside experts like Ashley Moffat, who has worked for many years in this field, who allowed us to actually harness the biological insights. And the opportunity of for training, and Rosa Vento told me, who's the, um, the lead author of this manuscript, is now uh, a new junior uh, uh, PI uh, in, in Sanger. So in, in, it wasn't just an effort to kind of like map the cells or you could say to deconstruct the maternal fetal interface, but it was also an effort where you could build analytical tools to understand how cells in that tissue were communicating through understanding the receptor ligands that may be um, uh, playing a part and also the molecular conversation that's taking on in, in that tissue sustaining um, healthy pregnancy. So I'm going to focus a little bit more of the more recent work on human fetal liver hematopoiesis, um, and that was led by Doreen Mirel Popescu, Rachel Botting, and Emily Stevenson in my lab, uh, which we published recently. And essentially, we took the fetal liver, along with other organs, to understand what happened in the liver, skin, and kidney, as I was telling you before, um, and uh, defined what are the different cell states or cell types that you can find in the fetal liver, all 27 <coughs> of these states, um, and we show that there were no granular sites. This starts to develop really um, after the bone marrow is formed in hum during human development. And one of the things that you can do with this data set is to basically infer the developmental trajectory of the differentiation pathway of these cells. And you can model that, um, and this is visualized here. This is a force-directed graph animation, which shows the yellow cells here the hematopoietic stem cells, uh, multipotent progenitors, and how they differentiate into the B cell lineage up here, the myeloid lineage, the red blood cells, the megakaryocytes, and the mast cells. So you can actually begin to try and understand how this process, which has otherwise been a black box in human, um, is, is actually taking place. Now, one of the surprising things that we found was that there were immature red blood cells and potentially physiological erythropoiesis in the skin during early development. And this is a time when there is a massive demand for oxygen and there is a great drive to generate red blood cells. And it shows that other organs outside of the kind of classical hematopoietic organs were also contributing to this process. Um, and here again, expertise from Irene Roberts, who taught me everything I needed to know about erythropoiesis, really made that biological insight apparent. And also collaborating outside across the channel with Alan Shadotal in Paris, uh, we were able to image the fetal skin to show where these immature erythroblasts were and you know, it, as they were maturing into red blood cells. Um, Alan is an expert on whole embryo imaging using light sheet microscopy. 
and we made more use of the data, greater insights, and this is you know, huge contributions, intellectual contribution, experimental support, and also interpreting the data from Elisa Laurenti and Bertie Gottgens, both of them here, in helping us understand what is it, as Bertie would say, that makes the HSCs supercharged during development. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, with Elisa's help was to grow up these stem cells from different gestational stages and found that the intrinsic potential of those stem cells changed with gestation. You produced different types of cells. You were less likely to produce red blood cells. You were more likely to produce myeloids or macrophages and neutrophils. And you were also more likely to produce B cells um, as the gestational stage increased. And fundamentally, um, this may be the mechanism of how the composition of the immune blood and immune cells in the fetal liver and, in, and you, in, the, in, the, in the organism itself is regulated. Now I've shown you all of these biological discoveries that were made possible by working together with many different groups. And we also were very keen that we made this data available to, to the wider research community, the clinical communities, and also um, industry partners and also the um, public. So we developed or we set up a, a web portal um, you can access the web portal through the developmentcellatlas.ncl.ac.uk. Um, and essentially, you can actually log on to any of these sort of like uh, uh, links, uh, which then takes you to, to the kind of like different um, exploratory opportunities. And we also incorporated the cell by gene um, software. So just very quick snippets. So this is basically, you know, the gene browser. So you can actually see all the different populations, hover your cursor, and it tells you the populations, type in the genes that you want, it'll show you which cell is expressing them, um, and, and you can kind of like interact with the data in a very browsable, intuitive way. Also look at all of the sample, the gender, all of that data is there. Look at the cell types you want, or you know, the cell types that you don't like. Um, so there's plenty that you can do, uh, and also different visualizations. Here's another way of looking at the data based at the population level. So all of the populations just tick, untick, whichever you like, um, you know, and then you can kind of like a type in the genes of interest to you by just adding them in those columns or just adding a list in the kind of column above, and then it'll display you the gene, and then you can actually kind of like uh, play around with the kind of columns for, you know, just push things around as you like, so there you go, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can also look at the trajectory in a kind of like a 3D format and look at all of the genes. So this is very important and moving forwards, I think this is the, really the way that we can actually disseminate the findings quickly uh, and to make a massive impact within biomedical science. So research acknowledgements, um, and this is my lab, we don't drink champagne every day. <laughs> um, Emily Stevenson, uh, also here with me, she was the first person who I appointed in my lab and she has been with me throughout this journey um, and really all of this work that has been um, in collaboration and joint production with Sarah's group, my many collaborators, some of which I have mentioned throughout my talk. And um, I want to put this slide up because I have to thank particularly Sarah Teichman, Sada Faruqi and Yasmin Belkate for guiding me, allowing me to grow and become confident uh, in my research career. Um, and um, Sadaf, particularly, is my AMS mentor, and I have immensely benefited from this um, scheme. Um, and she couldn't be here today because she's interviewing at Welcome. Um, and I hope that I can follow in their footsteps to increase the visibility of women in biomedical science um, to promote diversity and also be a role model uh, within biomedical science. And lastly, Maureen. I met Maureen a few days after the um, announcement, well, the, the, the letter came through announcing uh, me as, as the winner. And I was very struck by her, the warmth and her kindness and, kindness. and I realized very quickly what a personal journey um, and value the, the foundation and the medal is um, to you and your family. Uh, my father passed away a few weeks ago, and he would have been delighted today. Thank you.